So Seamus, last week we were all talking about Blender and uh, you had, you promised us that you were going to do some render farming. So I want to hear it. I want to hear all the dirty details. Okay. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, my web host. Like, I host my website and I don't mind telling you I pay 25 bucks a month to host 20-sided, which I think is very... Re that's, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, that's an amazing thing. If I wanted to set up my own data center, you know, that would be millions and millions <laughs> of dollars, right? But right. But I join the service and then, you know, I'm I'm using a tiny part of one computer, which is one part of a server rack, which is one part of a data center, which is using one part of, you know, an internet connection. And so like this this asset, this data center and its connectivity is being shared by tens of thousands of people spreading the cost across all of us so that, you know, it's 20 bucks a pop to, and we can all have a piece of this millions of dollars data center. And uh, that's pretty cool. And I anticipated or expected something similar when it came to render farms. So you would buy a, a small subscription or something and then you get access to this a bunch of computing. Right. Or you'd pay a flat fee for, you know, so many hours. And that's that's how it works. Well, so I looked at several services and the first couple you had to like spin up the service and get it going and then figure out how it worked. And you know, once you spin it up the meters oh, running. No. And I was like, that's great for when you know what you're doing and you know how much it costs ahead of time. But I don't want to sit there trying to figure out how to set it up and then suddenly look at the clock and realize I'm into this for a hundred bucks. Like that doesn't make any oh, sense. So, so they were charging you per hour instead of like per operation. Right. Which is fine. I, I don't mind that. I mean, if you've got control of the machine, what do they care if you're, if the CPU is working hard or not, if it's, if you, you, if this much of the machine is reserved for you, then, you know, that's how much you're using. If mm -hmm. I rent a hotel room, they don't care if I sleep on the floor. They don't make it cheaper. I got to pay for the whole room. Right. But the room isn't uh, running on an operating system that could right. very easily figure out how much of the room you're using and allocate the parts you're not using to other clients. It's true. It's true. But I was, I was willing to like, but the, the problem was I felt like I was about to get into a taxi cab for the first time and I have no idea how fast the meter runs and I have no concept, no context for how fast it might run. Like it's 20 cents an hour, 500 bucks an hour. I don't know. And without knowing and without knowing anything about how to set it up, I was like, this feels a little too grown up for me. This feels like, <laughs> th this feels like too much. This is a bad place to start. So then I found Rebus Farm, which interesting, uh, the word R-E-B-U-S, um, which as I understand it refers to a kind of puzzle where words are replaced with pictograms. I've never heard another human being say that out loud. Um, so I, my entire life, I've been internally pronouncing it Rebus. But then I saw the mm. ad for Rebus Farm and they're like, so-and-so Rebus Farm. And I'm like, oh, I, I guess it's good. I never had to discuss this kind of puzzle with anybody or they would have laughed at me. <laughs> or you've been missing the opportunity to be laughed at your whole life. Right. So Rebus Farm actually sounded pretty good. They've got a plug-in for Blender. So you're there. Ah. You're working in Blender, you hit a button, and it uploads the project you're currently working on. And um, you buy points ahead of time, so you can't accidentally just have the meter run away from you and suddenly you owe them a bunch of money. You you buy ahead of time. No, it's a prepay. Right. And I was like, this is this is more my speed. You upload it, you hit do the, the do the thing button, and it go. And then you, you know, download the result when it's done. So I did, you know, I fired it up and I'm like ready to render the, the project I up, I uploaded last week, which you saw the anti-entropy machine. Mm -hmm. Um, that was, it turned out to take 30 and a half hours to render. Um, the projection was 40 that that's reasonable. It's, it's hard to judge these things. Um, 
so you know it was projecting 40 hours of render time and it quoted me the price of 250 dollars yikes and i was like that oh, here's the here's the other thing that i thought was really bizarre you have to choose whether you want cpu or gpu rendering and gpu rendering is more much more expensive and i'm like what gpus like you pay for a graphics good graphics card is within the ballpark of a cpu but it contains you know multitudes of processing units right it is its name is legion for it is many maybe it's for like doing ev rendering or something something like real-time rendering right i don't know I was obviously trying to do cycles and cycle for those who don't mm -hmm. use blender EV is almost real time it took me I, I rendered the entire video in like 15 minutes using EV and like I said it took 30 and a half hours under cycles but cycles is a path tracing renderer like if you if you watch the video you can tell all those marbles have real actual reflections in them like they are actually reflecting each other correctly so yeah and they it, reflect the light onto the ground and the walls and everything it's pretty cool right right yeah it is very cool um and that takes a while that that gives your computer something to think about so gpu is more expensive so i was like oh this this is out of control and then i took it down to 720p rendering i was going to render it at 1080. yeah that video that's only 720p I was going to do it 1080, mm. but but uh, I took it down to 720p, and that's when it quoted 250 bucks at me. And I'm like, that's crazy. We're talking about, I'm I'm renting 30 hours or 40 hours of, the, the, we were projecting 40 hours. Uh, I'm going to rent 40 hours of time on a machine that, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't have a graphics card. I'm just renting the right. CPU. $250 is like... A good chunk of just buying the dang machine. Like, yeah. if this was a service you use regularly, you use it three times. You bought yourself another machine. Okay, but is this, like, distributed rendering so that it would take 40 hours, but you click the button and it's done in two minutes? I, I think it was telling me it would be done in 15. Okay. So, it, that, so it's like cool. buying, you know, a small portion of, like, a whole room full of machines. Right. But I still found those prices just outrageous. Like, I'm still, I mean, yes, I'm buying 40 hours of computer time concurrent, you know, I'm buying them in 15 minutes, but I'm still buying 40 hours of computer time. That should be pennies. I mean, the, you know, if we're talking about splitting up the cost of something over thousands of people, the lifespan of a computer is years and they run 24 <laughs> seven. How yeah. is 40 hours of time worth $250? So I decided not to do it. Um, I did find a bug in the Rebus interface um, where if you put... It, it only takes integers, which seems insane to me. So, like, I wanted to tell it... Uh, it, it asks you to say how fast your machine is and how long it takes to render a frame on your machine. Well, it took you know 20 seconds per frame on my machine so i typed in 0.333 minutes and apparently it rounds that up to one so no. it was it was tripling the the quote for me but even at that i mean that quote was i i feel it was about 10 times what it should be so you know one third it was still too expensive that's still almost a hundred dollars crazy um I found another service that is um, a little more complicated to set up, a little more scary, but it's it's like a it's like a dollar an hour for computer time. Not even that; it's ninety cents an hour for computer time, hmm. and for really high end computer, like computers that make mine look like a piece of junk. And I'm like, all right, ninety cents per hour. That would make my for one thing my my render probably wouldn't take 40 hours on that monster of a machine, you know. So we'd be looking right. at 20 to 30 bucks. And that feels about right to me. 
So I'm going to try again. Next time I have a project to render, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, cool. Hey, what's the name of that service? Oh, sorry. Um. Oh, yeah, that's the weird thing about this. It doesn't... They don't have a logo at the top of their page. You've got to look at the URL. It's cloudrender.farm. Huh. But, like, I was, like, looking. What is the name of this site that I'm looking at? Nowhere. Nowhere does it actually say. They just have a logo, but no name at the top <laughs> of the page. The really weird Gotta design. Gotta hire those marketing guys. Right? Yeah, it's just huh. called... It's just called Cloud Render, which is like, yeah, that's the kind of service you offer. There we go. <laughs> now, now they you must have hired to... TIA, the Texas Instruments guys, to do their marketing. <laughs> right. Internet Service 73. All right. Well, so that's my adventure. I'm surprised that got a domain. They should have just stuck with their IP address. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So that's what I have to report. What do you have for me this week, Paul? Well, uh, this past week, Introversion Software has released their final installation and final episode of uh, their master fail class that they've been doing for the past mm, maybe nine months or so. Okay. You're familiar with Introversion Software, right? Um, I've stopped by now and I stopped by every couple years. They made, uh, they're famous for making Prison Architect. Right. I've seen um, this city generator before. I believe it's this one. Yes. So, uh, so Introversion makes it, they're a small team. It's basically one programmer and then one marketing sales guy. Um, and then they've accumulated over the years more or less people. Sometimes it was just the core, you know, the couple of them. Sometimes it's as many as I think 10 or 12. But um, I've been following it for years and years. Uh, they released DEF CON back in 2009, I think. Um, and before that, they had a game called Uplink, which was incredible. I, The first time I played Uplink, I was so engrossed that the sirens that went on outside my house, like, you know, driving by on the street, freaked me Wait. out because I was like, oh, they found me. I've, I've been caught. <laughs> it's a hacking game. so And uh, so that was profoundly immersive um defcon uh multiwinia uh before that darwinia so anyway they've made a bunch of small games and stuff everyone knows them from the uh the big hit prison architect but before prison architect they you mean tree farmer on, this is <laughs> the tree farmer architect uh, before prison architect they were working on this prototype for a game called subversion which shares a name with a version control software unfortunately but also right. uh, they never really turned into a game so the latest episode is them talking about what went wrong with subversion how it didn't work uh you know what was cool about it and what what didn't work about it and why they eventually gave up on it um but the fail masterclass series is to me, fascinating because they're releasing their prototypes as playable prototypes with each episode. So they talk about a game, you know, they prototyped it, they show how the prototype works, and then they release the game and you can actually pay to buy the prototype and, and play it. I think it's like $5 minimum for the whole set. So you can buy the whole thing now, all the prototypes they've talked about for five bucks. And when they talk about Subversion, they release the Subversion City Generator and the Subversion uh, systems play game, including a level editor and all kinds of stuff. So it's all there now. You can actually play with the city generator yourself, which was just super exciting to me. Cool. It's funny this came up. I was just fiddling around with, uh, I was just entertaining the thought of doing center city generation in Blender. And I was avoiding looking online because I'm like, I'll bet somebody else has already done it. So I made a point of not looking because I didn't want to know that somebody else had already done it. Mm, yeah, the people have done it, but they haven't done it well. I actually bought a, a city generator pack for like 80 bucks, I think. And he's still working on developing it, but it's all straight line streets and stuff. It doesn't do any of the fun organic uh, curves and things in it. So... Or, right. or it does do some of that, but then it doesn't, it's it's like two separate systems. One of them is a grid city and one of them is like organic road city. So uh, I wasn't incredibly impressed. It's not bad. It's certainly not bad, but 
uh, for 80 bucks. I don't know. It takes all the fun out of it. Right. Yeah, you expect a lot more for 80 bucks. For 80 bucks, you kind of expect something that works. <laughs> well, it does. I mean, it does make really good looking cities. And, uh, and it's all instanced and, and you know, arrays and parametric and stuff. So you can edit things and change all the models to be different models and things. It's it's really cool. It's very it's a very neat system. I haven't played around with it as much as I'd like, but you know, things come up. I've actually been working on some scripting this past week in Blender. Uh, there's some cabinets in our kitchen that I wanted to make a decoration for and we wanted to put vines on it. And so then I started scripting a system in Blender to parametrically create vines. And pretty soon I was neck deep in uh, cosines and signs and making a system to... Right. The, the thing I'm happiest about is that I had a I figured out how to encode the parameters for that the script uses to generate the object into a parameter on the object so that when you select the object later you can say create a vine system and it'll copy the parameters for that particular one so you can try out a bunch of things you know and get a bunch of different designs and then experiment on them individually instead of remembering all the parameters that you set you know for the curve and the scale and the random seed and all that stuff Right. Oh, this week, I actually meant to before we started the show, but I'm going to ask you on the show. Um, one of the things that bothers me is that about Blender is that its physics system has no sound or no good integrated sound, right? Like you, mm, you can't yeah. just set it up to make sound effects when stuff smacks into each other. So I thought, but... If I could extract the positions of, like I was thinking of the anti-entropy machine, if I could extract the positions of all the balls on a per-frame basis, I could load that into Unity. Unity has 3D sound and Doppler and, you know, f fall off by distance. And you know, all I'd have to do is extract the camera and the balls and, you know... Um, you can tell when a ball hits something, if its velocity goes down a whole bunch abruptly, that's an impact. Mm -hmm, yeah. And, um, and you can get its velocity by just, you know, looking between two frames. And I was like, oh, you could probably cobble together. Now, you couldn't have different materials, but just as a first pass of making some noise that is positional to the camera you could load the whole thing in unity and have it make sound effects yeah and then i couldn't figure out how do i get the position of all this stuff per frame and i was just did like you it, did you bake the physics the physics are baked so there's a way to i don't remember off the top of my head but there's a way to convert baked physics to keyframes so that everything is keyframed and then uh -huh. from there, you should be able to just drop the whole Blender file into Unity because it'll import it. Oh, and maybe then it would have its per frame data. Yeah, I, I think if I think you have to convert it to keyframes for Unity to know what it's, it's doing with it. But as long as you're, I don't know if it's scripting is easier in Unity than in Blender, but if you're just going to be scripting, like checking the the position and speed of everything and then adding sounds, you can do that in Blender. You can have it add sounds to the um, the movie editing track, and and then you know do it that way. Yeah, but would it have positional audio and you know uh, be able to? The other important thing you need to be able to do. Not only do you need fall off for distance, so that it doesn't sound like everything's happening, you know, right on top of the camera. You need mm -hmm. positional, so you get left and right separation, and you need to be able to tweak. Um, you need to be able to tweak the pitch of it. I mean, you don't want to have to make 50 different sound effects. But if you make <laughs> right, five right. and you play them back randomly between, you know, 95 and 100 and 10 percent playback speed, just to give their their mm. pitch a little variation, that gives you that makes it sound like you've got 100 you know, different sound effects. So you don't get that incredibly mechanical sounds like just someone tapping the same object at the same position over and over again. Um, the popcorn right. effect. Um, yeah. So the ability to modulate pitch and do positional and fall off with distance. 
And I don't yeah. think you can do that. It, Blender doesn't have very good audio tools. It's basically just volume, I think. Uh, although you might be able to modify right. some other stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah. It might be might be easier to do in Unity then. Yeah. Yeah, I would try baking it to, to keyframes. See if that gets you anywhere. I will try that. All right. Um, did we finish up? I sort of interrupted you with the city generator. Did we finish up with that topic? Did you have more to say about uh, it? Yeah, not not really. I, well, when I was playing with the city generator, I noticed that it's not very strictly correct. Like there is a lot of, you know, when you do offsets and the corner overlaps itself. And so you get that weird little hourglass shape. Mm, I'm not sure what you mean. So if you've got a, like a, a corner that's got a chamfer on it, and then you're just doing a simple offset on the, the faces to make it smaller. So like you've got a street, right, that goes around a corner. Oh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yes, yeah. and so you try and make... Yeah, you want to you take a curve and make a smaller version of that same curve. But if you don't recalculate the normals right away... Um, or if you don't base it on the normals, then two of the vertices can cross over and you'll, they'll turn a polygon inside out. Yes, mm -hmm. I've seen this problem before. Have fixed this problem many times before. <laughs> <laughs> right. And ideally, you'd get rid of the, the vertice, right? Of yes. The smaller face and just end up with two larger faces forming a, a harder angle. But anyway, so they... They were not doing that math there, but like the city generator was also its own engine. Like it wasn't built on another engine. It's like doing it all its own rendering and doing all its own polygon generation and doing all its own lighting and everything. So, uh, I mean, and obviously it's a prototype, so it wasn't really polished, but it was just interesting to look at and be like, okay, this is running kind of slow and it's, it's not fast. Like it's, it's impressively not fast. And I'm not sure why that is, but, um, the whole thing is kind of, kind of janky. And so it's interesting to just look at it and be like, is this, is this all like running in CPU? Are they sending this all to the GPU every frame? What's going on here? Right, right. Huh. Well, it is interesting looking. And I do think that the aerial views, especially on, I'll link the page in the show notes. They've got an aerial view of what looks like a, a an oceanfront city, maybe, maybe a, a river leading out into the ocean. And it looks real good. I, I like the, the, they have correctly done a lot of things with building height distribution. Um, you know, classic rookie mistake is, well, big cities have tall buildings. And so all buildings are just like 40 story monsters. But actually those really yeah. big ones are, are pretty rare. And I wouldn't be surprised. I've never done a study but I'll bet you there's a logarithmic fall off with building height. Mm -hmm. Like there'll be yeah, probably 10 times as many of these smaller buildings as they are of these bigger buildings. And then 10 times more of these like, you know, low rise buildings compared to those me medium sized buildings, that kind of thing. Yeah. I also just love how they did the, the streets that are all organically grown and, you know, and some of them are straight because right. like, they were placed there before, and then it kind of connects them all with these little alleys, and it's is very neat. It's very nice, nicely done. Mm. It looks good. I mean, I'm just looking at like uh, it's, it's not wireframe. I, I guess it is, but it's solid. You know, you can't just see through everything. But it looks really good. It's solid. If you've got bridges, the bridges are just lines, though. They didn't like build a suspension bridge or or whatever, but. It has bridges, and it doesn't have, like, a hundred bridges, and it doesn't have any obviously redundant bridges. Like, yeah. the bridges kind of make, the bridges kind of make sense. Yeah, there would be a bri bridge here, and there would be a bridge here, and you wouldn't have another one across this same piece of water just because it's a different angle. And, yeah, a lot of hard problems were solved here. That That's really, there's a lot to be proud of here. And to be fair, they based it off of a, an academic paper that somebody wrote years ago. So it wasn't all like their own development, but they did put together a really good implementation. I read that paper years ago. I can't remember it now, but um, I believe I believe I know the one that they that they based it on. Like back mm. when I did Pixel City, 
like 50 people all sent me the same PDF. <laughs> like, have you read this <laughs> since you're the city guy? And it, it, it was really interesting. Of course, it's been, you know, 12 years. I haven't, I haven't seen it. <laughs> um, so I don't remember it now, but I believe I read that paper and it was pretty good. And it, and it made a lot of things clear that I had done incorrectly. Like Pixel City is no longer. I and people still like make a fuss. Oh, Pixel City is so great. I'm like, Ugh, it's a little cringe for me now. I see it as, <laughs> I see it as a lot of mistake. For one thing, I made the mistake where all the buildings are tall, or too many of them. The the heights do not stagger enough. There are too many mm -hmm. buildings that are in the very tall category. Anyway, what do you say we do some mailbags? Yeah. All right. Uh, you can have this first one. Dear Diecast, you remember that Wendy's RPG? Well, now, apparently, Arby's is selling tabletop gaming dice. And there's a link. Uh, just thought it was cute. Have fast food places realize who their core demo is or something? Jennifer Snow. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, I, I did look, go look at this, and it's a short article. Um, I was mostly a little bit concerned that the article only refers to polyhedral dice as Dungeons and Dragons dice. Oh, classic faux pas. How do you do, fellow kids? Yeah. Role-playing dice is a more acceptable nomenclature. But polyhedral dice is what you say if you're, if you're one of the cool kids. And if you want to be really cool, it's platonic solids. No, no, no. No one says that. <laughs> <laughs> right now i'm 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 not into the platonic solids i like the romantic solids <laughs> turn the lights down low get some <laughs> romantic solids out i like these solids but just as a friend <laughs> so so these dice are they're they're kind of weird like there's the arby's symbol for the 20 i think oh that's cool what is the Arby? So the friggin' hat? Really? Yeah. The hat is your 20? I think so, if I remember it correctly. I'm not gonna look at it right now. Right, right, obviously. So, but otherwise, they're just like, these are just dice. That's okay. Okay. That is fun. But yeah, they, they, that, that is a little worrisome that they call it Dungeons and Dragons dice. Maybe they're doing that. Maybe they know better, but they're worried too many people in their core demo don't know any better. But then why would those? Mm, why right. would you sell dice? Why to would those I want people? these these polyhedral dice? What am I going to do with them? Oh, well, you could play Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, I see. That's what these are for. Right. Yeah. You could explain geometry to your kids and why there are only five platonic solids. Oh, okay. Cool. Platonic solids dice. Said no one ever. Okay, on to the next email. <laughs> Dear Diecast, I've recently been playing the Master Blaster Zero series. All right, for for me, Master Bla the the term Master Blaster has gotten used many times in history. Um, I believe it was in one of the Mad Max movies. I believe there was a sound card or something to do with Sound Blaster sound cards that called itself Master Blaster. And now here's this person calling themselves Master Blaster. But for me, the OG Master Blaster was a super now obscure 80s cartoon called Kid Video. Hmm. Does anybody remember Kid Video? Here's the hook with Kid Video. It was a <clears throat> band. I'm, I'm air quoting as hard as I can at you here, Paul. Okay. Um, I mean, these they were apparently a band i don't know if they could actually play their instruments but the idea was that there was this it was a manufactured like this was before the age of the boy band but after the monkeys so this was another attempt to manufacture a pop group okay hmm. and the idea this time well we'll manufacture a pop group and then we'll give them their own saturday morning cartoon to have adventures in and the bad guy in the show like they got they got taken to this realm this other cartoon realm like when they're in the real world they're live action actors 
but then they get sucked into the cartoon world, which is called the flip side. And they want to get back to the real world, where they're like famous pop stars. And um, But the Master Blaster is always trying to stop them or steal their music or something. And like once an episode, they would take some top 40s hit and like animate some action scene on top of it, like some chase or whatever. Did okay? Did did Homestar Runners Strong Bad create a limousine comic making fun of this this <gasps> thing? I have wondered if that was inspired by. I I know the comic you're talking about. The, the the limousine band apparently had their own Saturday morning cartoon, and I wondered when I as soon as I saw that I thought, I wonder if this is based if this was inspired by Kid Video, because it did space strike, and all that right, stuff. Right now, Kid Video didn't go to space, but it feels the same. Where you've got a real band having cartoon adventures, huh? Anyway, so that's the Master Blaster. I can't remember what he looked like, but in my mind, he's been replaced with the pointy-haired boss from Dilbert. <laughs> that is not how I expected that sentence to end. Let me see. Uh, you know what? He's not far off. Yeah, I just Googled him. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just... Yeah, he's not far from the... the also, of course, Kid Video has his own friggin' wiki. Of course, this super obscure 80s cartoon that nobody remembers. He looks like a combination between, um, from Spider-Man and the pointy-haired boss from Dilbert. <laughs> Here, I just posted a, a link into the show notes for you, Paul. All right, I'll have to look this up. Yeah. So that was a tangent about the Master Blaster. So uh, please tell me I'm not the only one. I'm, I'm obviously not the only person. Somebody went and made a friggin' wiki on it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. But, and and Dr. Evil from Inspector Gadget. Right? Uh, that's Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget or Dr. Evil from Austin Powers. Oh, okay. And Dr. Evil. I always get those two mixed up. Right. Dr. Evil from Austin Powers is actually... Mike Myers doing an impression of Dana Carvey doing an impression of the guy who has who runs Saturday Night Live. <laughs> okay, I this is fascinating, but you have finished reading the first half of the first sentence of the first paragraph of this not insignificantly long email. If we're going to be here a while. Let me start over. Dear Cat Diecast, I've recently been playing the, the Master Blaster Zero series, a Metroid-esque. Hey, Metroid reminds me of this thing back in the age. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> this Metroid-esque game that interleaves the platforming shooting with 2D top-down shooting segments. An interesting feature of these games is the end game reset just before the final level. All your collected weapons and other stuff are removed and you get a very different set of abilities and weapons to master for the final portion of the game. In these games, the final level only unlocks when you've collected enough stuff. So it can be seen as like a bonus level as well. I think the end game reset can, in theory, be applied to any game with optional character progression. Are there any games where you think the end game reset has been applied extremely well or poorly? What games could be improved with an end game reset? Um, and I, I think we can stop reading there with kind of guards Marvin. So the only end game reset that I can think of is at the end of Half-Life 2, you go in, you, you go into the Citadel and it takes away all your guns and just gives you the super gravity gun. And that's an end game reset where it takes away everything you've got. And then you have a slightly different set of mechanics to play with. Um, that always struck me as being an incredibly risky thing to do. Mm. You know, the player spends the entire game getting fam familiar with one set of mechanics, and then you're going to do the old switcheroo on them. You'd better, you whatever you replace it with had better be magical and perfect and probably shouldn't go on for too long because, you know, you're, you're basically erasing all their hard work. Yeah. Although in Half-Life 2, it's not a hard reset because they introduce the gravity gun more than like just a couple of episodes in to the or right. chapters, I guess, into the game. And it's you're required to use it throughout the game. So you are familiar with it. 
by the time you get there. But it's kind of like a, a very narrow, it's a, an in, incredibly intense narrowing of the uh, options that you have. Right. You lose all your guns and then one of your guns becomes much more powerful. Mm. Mm. I get it, like I wouldn't want to see that in Doom, even if it was like, okay, the double barrel shotgun now does ten times as much damage and all the other weapons are worthless. Like that would be great for thirty seconds and then you'd be like, uh, I'm okay, I've heard that boom enough times now and it's just starting to become numbing. <laughs> I wanna do something else. Give me back one of the other guns. Hmm. So I don't know. I don't know. I know the the Mega Man series does something like this. It's not the same, but it's it's uh, each boss has a each boss has a weapon that you get from him when you kill him, and each boss is each boss's weapon is particularly effective against one of the other bosses. And so, if you can kill one of them with your normal weapon, then you can go and take that weapon against some other boss is really effective against and kind of work your way through all the bosses so it's not really a reset it's more like more like a an option it's like a, a superpower option or something interesting yeah like what other games do this like this like morvin here is talking about this like it's done regularly but i it's not common in my experience not common among the games that i play and i can't think of any other examples of it do any of the final fantasies do that it seems like the kind of thing a final fantasy game might do uh, none of the ones I've played, unless you count like, oh, here, we're going to take away your favorite characters and here's a bunch of losers that have been sitting on the bench since level 10. Use them. Have fun. <laughs> That's kind of a reset. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's like, if you know ahead of a, ahead of time to be leveling them, oh, that, that whole thing's a terrible system. It's all awful. Mm. Um. Especially when you have a cast of seven characters, keeping seven people leveled is asking a bit much for the, from the player, I think. When you can only have three at a time. Like, it's not even like you have six people, so you can have an A team and a B team that you flip. It's like seven. So you have this stupid balancing problem. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. And so, like, so he's talking about, like, almost a new set of mechanics that come in right at the end game. Right, and that's pretty rare. Yeah, pretty rare. Hmm. I mean, it seems like a bad idea, just kind of off the top. Seems to go against sort of the premise of, especially AAA games built around a really strong central core mechanics. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What about um, what about unfolding games? Games that you know, like you start off doing a text adventure and then it unfolds into like a city management game and then it unfolds into like like uh, the paperclip game or whatever. It's kind of like that. I have not played that. I don't know, would that be considered an end game? Re re every new phase is kind of like the end game of the previous phase. Maybe yeah. you could think Spore kind of did that? Yeah, kind of. A bit when, you know, every time you went to a new phase, it kind of reset. Oh, well, until you sort of finalized your your creature and then it stopped resetting you it would really suck if if you had to reset your entire society back to the stone age to get from the industrial age to the space age <laughs> <laughs> that'd be that'd be a pretty heavy-handed lesson about the dangers of nuclear technology i guess right i don't know it seems like a risky thing it's not something i would have the guts to try yeah yeah here's this whole this whole thing you're getting good at and I guess okay so I I guess it would have to be something if it was going to be a good idea it would have to be something where and maybe this is what Master Blaster does where the core systems are the same but the way that you're interacting with them changes so you don't have to throw out everything you learned you're just faced with it's like a, it's like the final exam right like do you really understand the systems or do you just understand your tools and it's like okay well here's a whole bunch of different tools that interact with the same systems. So as, as long as you were paying attention to what's actually going on, you should be fine. But if you were just like, oh, I know how to use this one thing, then you're going to be hosed. Interesting. All right, this next topic strikes me as ominous. Dear Diecast, I found this interesting video by Lessons from the Screenplay about adapting the Mass Effect trilogy into a TV show. So what are your thoughts? Donkey. Thank you, Donkey. 
So I used to watch a lot of lessons from the screenplay, and I didn't unsubscribe. This is just one of those times YouTube stopped telling me about a channel, and you know, and so you just stop going there. So like this, this channel fell off my radar about a year ago, and I didn't even notice until now. I was like, lessons from the screenplay. I haven't seen one of those in ages. It keeps recommending Patrick Willems to me, and Patrick Willems is talented, but his his videos like have a lot of skits in them, and I always fast forward through the skits. I'm just there. He mixes his video essay with skits, hmm. and or with scenes. Like it, he has an ongoing, unfolding story of him and his friends being internet video makers, filmmakers. <laughs> Very meta. Right. And some of them are good and some of them are really tedious. And I've kind of like been not super into them, but they like sit in my queue forever. And YouTube is like, hey, I've got another Patrick Willems for you. And here's another Patrick Willa. And I'm like, fine, I'll watch it. And I end up, you know, just shuttling through it, just scrubbing through it until I could get to the video essay, watch the essay, and then just, like, leave bef before the rest of the skit is inflicted on me. And meanwhile, apparently Lessons from the Screenplay has been churning out videos for the last year, and I didn't even know because YouTube didn't think to show me any of those. And I'm really upset with the algorithm. Like, if I so pass on a video 20 times... Do you ever go to your subscription page? Uh, no, I don't anymore. Like, it used to be the front page was your subscription page. Oh. Yeah, that's like, I don't ever go to the front page. I just go to my subscription page these days. Right. And that that's probably, like, can you even get there anymore? Like, you, you probably can. It's probably just been moved, and I got lost, and I fell into just following what the algorithm was giving me. Anyway. So did you I watch sorry this, for this episode? I did. I watched about half of it, and I would just... Like, the, I wasn't buying the premise of it. Okay, Michael from Lessons of the Screen... I, I love Michael's work, by the way. Um, from Lessons from the Screenplay makes a case. He and his friend basically envisioned, you know, a Mass Effect TV show. Like, wow, this would make a really good TV show. And, I mean, yeah, you could... Like, 30 years ago, you could make a really good TV show out of this. <laughs> In fact, they did. They called it Star Trek The Next Generation. And we saw what happened to it. As that they, you know, recently they've made a couple more Star Trek shows. And now they're Star Trek Pew 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 in space. Shoot all the bad guys. In space. Adventures uh -huh. in space. They like, even made some, some games out of that where, like, the starship enterprise e had iron sights on it and everything <laughs> right it's like um translating to another medium is always incredibly risky because you know when you move to another medium you must change creators tolkien was not a filmmaker he could not make any movies you have mm -hmm. to hand the project off to somebody who is not tolkien Will that person get the essence of Lord of the Rings? Will they get the essential elements of it enough to like capture the heart of the work? Or will they be like, oh yeah, fantasy adventure. I, I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, well, I've seen a million of these and they'll just like fit it into the existing fantasy template. Oh, there's not a love story here. That's kind of weird. I better add You one. really have... Yeah, you really have multiple fail states because if the original work is not that good, then you're going to have to adapt it so that it's, it you know, fix the bad parts in it before you start adapting it. And if the person who's adapting it isn't that good, then they're going to want to, like you said, you know, shoehorn in all these popular, you know, current trends or whatever into the story. But there's also problems if the person who originally wrote the story is really, really skilled and talented because then they will have crafted their story to be perfect for the medium that they're conveying it in. And if the yeah. person who's really good at adapting it is, you know, is, is really good at what they're doing, then they are also going to want to craft it perfectly to it to fit really well with the medium that they're adapting it for. So either way, no matter it, 
if either side is skilled or not skilled, there's going to be changes. Maybe they'll be for the better, hopefully, but a lot of times it's hard to tell if they're better or worse when you can just see that they're different. Right. One of the problems you have is that, of course, a really well-crafted book will be a really good book. And the first thing you get, the problem you have is, oh, here's this fantastic work. I need you to reproduce it, but I need you to chop 90% of it away. <laughs> right. I need you to throw out 90% of it. So just keep the 10% that like defines it. And then you're going to have to tell this same story, but without any of the, in, uh, any of, um, you know, the characters have internal monologues. You, we can just read their thoughts. You can't do that in a movie. That's super boring. That's voiceover. That's horrible. And so they're like, well, mm -hmm. ugh, you know, I need my character to like express their thoughts. So I got to give them a sidekick character so that they have somebody to talk to. So we know what they're thinking. So we know what they're doing, why the, they're doing the things that they're doing. Right. And then or all, you have to and, craft scenes in which they can express their thoughts through actions or whatever it is. Right. And then you're even in a worse problem. You've got to throw away 90% of the story and add things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, you're so doomed. And then there's the, you know, what if the original story isn't good? What if the new creator isn't good? What if... They're both good, but the, you know, the adaptation, you know, a brilliant filmmaker might not be good at adapting this kind of story. They might be a good filmmaker, but bad for this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. <laughs> or, um, and all the other things that can go wrong with casting, art design, you know, so much yeah. that can go wrong. Editing, marketing, all of it. R right. Oh, the Teen Titans trailer. We're we're Robin. Do you remember that? Oh, that show still exists. I see that, I think, on HBO every once in a while. And I'm like, I will never have time for that show. Um, it's uh, And then even if all that works out, there's just the problem of adapting is hard and expensive. And, you, you know, what if you everybody's on board? Everybody wants to do a good job. Everybody has the, t everybody has the skills to do a good job. But you just don't get enough budget. And you have to make this you know, weird, compromised, chopped down, or like Ralph Baskey, 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 um, made his Lord of the Rings and they wouldn't give him the money for the second movie unless the first movie did well, but the first movie had to wrap itself up without knowing that it could finish the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right. Like if I, if I was trying to sabotage his movie, I don't think I could do better than that. I want you to take half, half, half of a trilogy of books and make one movie out of it, and it's got to be a full and complete story. And I'll only give you more money if that one does well. I think it may have been worse. I I thought the original plan was for it to be one movie that was all three books, and then he ran out of money toward the end and was like, "Hey, can I have more money?" And they're like, "Nah, just end it. Just wrap it all up. It'll be fine." Wow. So, to, I, I realize I've taken us on a long route to get back to where to the point I wanted to make, but I think that Mass Effect could, in the right hands, be perfect for a TV show. It could probably make a better TV show than a lot of TV sh than it was a video game. Like it was a shooter that was really about talking and discovering and learning and exploring to a certain extent the need to have commander shepherd shoot 30 people every five minutes sometimes got in the way of the story it was trying to tell I'm, i don't it didn't make it bad but it would have been better as a story if you did not have that obligation yeah or you'd, you have to have shooter gameplay, but what if this episode just really needs some space combat and talking, and that's it? Well, we need to have shooting gameplay. We need to figure out some reason for the protagonist to go somewhere and shoot 30 or 40 people. And uh, Yeah, it seems like the gameplay was would really have been better with Rex as the main character. <laughs> right. <laughs> Shepard. Um, so... I have no faith that a Mass Effect should... I, I believe it could be done, but 
in today's world, there's no way. We can't even get a good Star Trek made. And we have working blueprints to, to, to work from for that. And nobody can make Star Trek now. So what are the chances that somebody could make Mass Effect? Almost nothing. Almost zero. And so hmm. watching Michael like propose this and his TV show is the story of Commander Shepard, which I also think would be a mistake. We've seen that story and we know that it dissolves into nonsense and stupidity. I don't want to see that story again. I want to see the universe. Tell a story about someone else. Yeah. <gasps> someone that someone that doesn't someone that has a grand adventure of important events who never ever meets the elusive man and who never has an encounter with <laughs> Kai Lang. That's what I want. And um, ah. yeah, I have absolutely no faith that in fact, most people when they're trying to adapt it would start with the popular games, which are the second two, you know, they wouldn't start with the foundation. They would start with yeah. the surface. I did notice that his summary of Mass Effect seemed to draw more from the later two games than right. from the first one. Which, fair enough, if that's what he's doing. Yeah. Right, that's a fan of the series who under, who played the games. Now you hand the project off to a TV executive, it, you, you're not going to get Mass Effect. You're going to get Spaceman Adventures in Space, man. With shooty um, shoot pew pew sexy aliens times oh space yeah thing space tits space tits the movie um the ongoing yeah. serial <laughs> um so yeah that that i i have no faith in it i am sorry to be negative donkey i don't think it'll work all right do we dare try another one or should we wrap this up now oh man we only have two left we could finish them but it, it is getting a little long Let's save something for next week. All right. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. We've got a couple left in the mailbag. We'll get to those next week, hopefully. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. So you're going to make a, a render farm generator now in Blender, right? That like generates a render farm so that you can use it to render the video that you just generated. Um, I'm pretty sure that violates um, information theory. So yes, I'm going to do that. I mean, a render farm would actually be pretty easy to procedurally generate. It's just like rows and rows <laughs> of racks, right? <laughs> just rows of boxes. And the sound effects wouldn't be hard either. It'd just be this continuous hum at all times. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, you know, the noise removal that we do for the diecast, just take that and, you know, remove the whole diecast, just the hum. Right? <laughs> Maybe you have an air conditioner blowing in the background. It's perfect.